Can you guys hear and see me? I heard something. Is that you, Erica? Oh, there you are. You're hitting in the corner. I do see your. Uh, uh, yes, there no. No. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. Hello. Good morning. Um, welcome, welcome. We've got a nice little group here. Um, I was going to wait just a couple of minutes for people to come in, but I think um, it's actually filling up. Um, we've got almost the amount of people who um, I think signed up or who I saw 
on lists. Um, feel free to turn on your video if you want to so we can actually see your faces. <laughs> um, basically, it's going to be pretty casual this morning. It's just us. Um, for those of you who are in the crazy um, college welcome thing with 1600 people, this is not that. Um, it's a little bit more intimate. It's just us. I'm Erica Cephalo. I'm your major advisor and I think I've probably met most if not all of you. Um, and so this morning, um, because most of you have already talked to me way too much, I wanted to introduce you to some other advisors. Um, and <clears throat> I'm going to have Everybody just kind of give a casual um, introduction of themselves and um, talk a little bit about um, our, our program, our curriculum. Um, and then uh, at the end of it, we'd love to hear some questions from you. Um, so the first person I wanted to introduce is Brian Todd. He's our master advisor and he is coming to us live from somewhere in the desert. Brian? Yeah, I'm in the Mojave Desert about... Oh, is your <coughs> microphone not working? Are you muted? It should be. I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Oh. Let me see. The home you, from... you hear me? I can me? hear you too, Brian. I can hear you. Erica, maybe you've you can got... Hear <gasps> Sounds like everybody oh. can hear me except Erica. My sound is an app. Because <laughs> right. I was trying to get rid of my music. That's why. I did like this cool fade out. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Your your cool I'm factor gone. faded yeah. out, I guess. <laughs> a valiant effort, so but you cool. know, we're all learning on this technology, <laughs> even though we've been doing Zoom stuff I'm all so summer. Okay, well, um, okay, there we go. Um, sorry, all right, so, Brian. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Professor Brian Todd. I'm a conservation biologist. I work primarily with reptiles and amphibians, and being in the desert is a good place to see a lot of reptiles. Um, I wear the conservation biology hat probably more than I wear a herpetology hat. Uh, so the research project I'm doing down here actually involves recovering um, a species that's listed under California's Endangered Species Act and the U.S. Endangered Species Act, and that is the desert tortoise. And if you'll bear with me just a second, These are the little guys that I'm working with. Can everybody see this dude? Is this not the most adorable thing you've ever seen? Oh my gosh. Th this is the future of this species in my hand, literally. And so I've been running a project down here with a few colleagues from the University of Georgia studying head starting, which is the process of taking these tiny little hatchlings, this guy's a month old, and growing them to larger sizes where we release them in the desert and we study their survival and the things that eat them and what they die from <clears throat> to try and rehabilitate and recover populations that have declined across the range of the desert tortoise, which stretches from California through parts of Arizona, a lot of Southern Nevada and up into Utah. <clears throat> so that's my sort of research capacity. I do a lot of projects related to conservation of reptiles and amphibians. And uh, in my teaching capacity, I used to teach conservation biology. We have another professor of conservation biology now who does that. So I mostly teach herpetology. I teach a field course. I teach WFC 10, which is our intro level um, required course for wildlife ecology and conservation that includes a lot of guest lectures from the other faculty in the department. <clears throat> and probably most important to all of you, and the reason I'm here, is that I am also the faculty master advisor and so the master advisor is sort of the very last backstop who makes a lot of the decisions about substitutions for courses, uh, provides insight into advising to each of you. I have a lot of behind the scenes roles that you'll never be exposed to, but affect your education. I work with the faculty to help them develop their courses, to make sure that our courses meet the objectives of our undergraduate program in wildlife, fish, and conservation biology. <clears throat> but each of you also have an individual faculty advisor um, who is assigned to you, and that's one of the members of our department, a faculty member. And then Erica is our staff advisor, and she is uh, the most on top of everything day to day as it comes to interacting with students, getting you the resources you need, uh, providing you the information you need, 
And then the other two advising staff that you'll see a lot of are our peer advisors. And John Liu is one of our peer advisors. And Erica, I don't know, do we have our other new peer advisor on? We do. And there she and is, Maria. Maria. And both of them will talk a little bit after you, so um, they'll get a chance to, to meet them as well. So they are our two peer advisors. So if you go to our website or you, uh, if life ever returns to normal and you're walking around the department, the peer advisors are other students who have either been through the program or are going through the program. So they know it very well. They've had a lot of interactions with the faculty. They've taken courses. They can give you ideas about the best courses for your needs. Uh, they will often be the people that will respond to the emails that go out to the peer advisor. Um, Erica will also reply to the WFCB advising email. And then usually I'm here for some of the bigger picture questions and problems. Uh, I can certainly provide uh, advice and uh, guidance for things related to the profession, your undergraduate career, maybe what comes next, internship opportunities. But your individual faculty advisors to whom you'll be assigned will also be a really good resource. I think that's it for my initial opening spiel. I've got a lot of other, um, you know, tips and wisdom to share, but you know, you get what you pay for and I'm doing this for free. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so Erica, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Yeah. Th and thank you so much for joining us today. And I know that it, um, the, the internet connection out where you're at is not uh, the easiest thing to get. So I really Yeah, and, and just to put a pin on it, again, I'm an hour outside of Las Vegas. I'm in the Mojave National Preserve. I'm working on my laptop, tethered to my iPhone with dodgy internet. Um, and uh, it's pretty mild here. It's actually cooler here than it is in Davis. And the air quality is a lot better here than it is in Davis too. I think largely because of the Napa fires. And um, I'm an only parent. I'm raising a seven-year-old. We're doing the homeschooling. He's sitting right next to me watching Netflix because we finished all of his work this morning. Um, and we had not been able to go outside for a month in Davis. So that was lovely. Um, so even if there wasn't coronavirus, there was the air quality and the furnace level heat we had. Yep, I can feel that. And I, you may be able to hear my five-year-old screaming outside my door right now actually <laughs> so right there with you except i'm in davis um all right well um i i don't know if you can stick around or not um, yeah i can hang out for a while and if i get disconnected yeah. i'll try and rejoin i'll send you an email if i can't okay. okay okay great um so but next um i wanted to bring up john lou speaking of our peer advisors john um is going to talk to us Hey, um, so I think you're going to talk to us a little bit about curriculum and fish or <laughs> whatever <laughs> you feel like talking about. Exactly. Hey, everyone. Um, first of all, welcome. We're super excited to have you as part of the wildlife um, conservation team. Uh, my name is John. I am a fourth year wildlife fish conservation biology major, and I am in the area specialization of fish. Um, I use he, him pronouns. And today I will be telling you a little bit about, um, first of all, like the coursework that you'll be going through, what it's like as a student going through these classes, um, places that you can get help um, if you need it, especially now um, with uh, remote working. Um, and finally, there were some uh, questions in the chat that I saw earlier that I'll go ahead and bring up in a little bit. So first of all, classes. So I know that we have some uh, freshmen here. We also have some transfer students. Um, so as far as freshmen, you guys should have made a schedule with Erica already. Um, and you know that the first couple of years you'll be doing your prereqs. So those are classes like your biology classes, math classes. Um, but you also get to take some really fun classes. Like Brian mentioned earlier, we have the WFC 10 course, which was honestly my favorite course still till this day. Um, you get to meet all the professors. There's a lot of guest lectures going on. Uh, and it's just a really good like taster of what the major is all about. Um, you can also take the WFC 10 class, which is more focused on California um, animals. So that's another really cool class that you can take. Of course, for transfer students, um, y'all would have gone through most of your prereqs. So you'll be going into um, some more fun classes that, you know, the upper divs. Uh, and these are classes like your organismal core classes. So that's where, you know, the teams come in, team fish, herps, mammals, and um, what am I missing? Birds. birds. But nobody important. cares about them. 
Just kidding. Um, they're yeah. just fancy so, reptiles. They're just uh, they're exactly. just reptiles with um, you know fancy clothing. <laughs> We're dinosaurs, but you know, <laughs> dinosaurs are just reptiles. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but there was a question earlier about, um, you know, maybe wanting to do something like animal behavior. And so we have area of specializations or AOSs. Um, we have four of them. You can do general wildlife conservation biology, which I'd say most people do. Um, we have fish biology, if you're a team fish. Um, we have wildlife health, if you're interested in going into vet school. And we also have an individualized area of specialization. Now that's where you can um, incorporate something like animal behavior if you're particularly interested in, and that's something you can discuss with your faculty advisor as you progress um, through the major. Um, and then there was also a question regarding the differences between um, the fish air specialization in WFC and also the marine bio major. Um, I would say the primary difference is that um, with WFCB and the fish biology area specialization, we're more focused on sort of the conservation aspect and how um, we can go about navigating fish in a human world as compared to marine bio where they're much more focused on individual systems um, and how um, these abiotic and biotic things are interacting with each other um, in mostly our oceans. Um, we also have more of a focus on freshwater, especially California native species. Cool. Uh, another thing is school can be hard, especially now when we're all at home um, and we maybe don't have as much access to things on campus. But the good thing is that we've had a lot of time to prepare for this. Um, all the professors and the school have set up the infrastructure to help us with this. So um, one of the really great resources that you can use right off the bat is the Academic Assistance and Tutoring Center. Um, they have trans transitioned everything online. Um, so I'll go ahead and send out the link in the chat. Um, so that first link will lead you to the appointment system that they use. Um, and that's just a Google form that you can fill out. There's also tutoring services for your writing. So if in any class um, you have any essays, you can go ahead and make an appointment with the writing tutors and they will walk you step by step through the writing process and help you out with your paper. Um, so for the um, AATC, which is the Academic Assistance Tutoring Center, um, they help you with things like your general chemistry classes, your math classes, physics, and stats. Um, and for those of you that are transfers, they'll also help you with all of your upper division biz classes. Um, if you're looking for help for things like your wildlife classes or things that are more specific, a great resource is, of course, your professors and also your TAs. Um, they'll be having virtual office hours, so definitely check in. I know sometimes it's really hard to uh, make the effort to zoom in, but um, they are the most knowledgeable with all those classes, and I'm sure they have um, plenty of time slotted out to help you guys, so definitely do that. Um, and there'll also be drop-in hours at the AATC starting October 12th. So um, anytime you need help, they'll have like designated hours. I think it's like eight o'clock to like three or four. Um, and you'll just be able to click a Zoom link and they'll direct you to someone that can help you. Uh, I really like using that resource because most of the tutors are peers, um, people who have taken the class within the past like couple of years. So they know exactly um, what the homeworks are like and how you can you know, be successful in the test because they just recently taken them. Um, and if there's any questions that they can't answer, there's also professional um, advising staff on hand to jump into any of the calls. So I just wanna leave off with saying that, you know, things are a little bit weird right now and school can definitely be tough, um, but don't be afraid to reach out to any of us. Um, Maria and I are always here to help you as, as well as all the um, tutoring staff. Um, and don't be afraid to celebrate the little successes too, because that's what we really need to be doing right now. So if there's any questions about um, coursework or anything along those lines, go ahead and uh, turn on your mic or drop something in the chat and we can uh, get those answered for you. And I also wanted to follow up. There was something that John said that, that stuck out at me. John said uh, that we've all had plenty of time to be adjusting and preparing for this uh, online world. And I would just clarify that the campus has done a wonderful job getting things ready. Our staff is really on top of things. 
but us individual faculty range anywhere from pretty proficient to borderline disaster. Um, and I want you guys to all be aware that, you know, we're not um, genius, um, you know, professors that can do a million things at once. We're people just like you. And uh, we are all going to do our absolute best. I know that for most of us, teaching is about 25% of what we do. It's about 25% of our appointment. We spend a lot of time doing research, administration, managing undergraduate and graduate staff and students, budgets. Um, and we all want to give you the best experience we can. And we're all working really hard behind the scenes to try and prepare our courses. But if things don't go smoothly, we get it. We're going to be doing the same kinds of things and having the same kinds of fun and making mistakes that you will. I think you'll also find that because we're all people and we're all flawed and we're all doing our best as faculty in the department, we all acknowledge that our students are going to be challenged with some of the similar things as well as a lot of things that we can't predict. So you'll find that most of us are very approachable. I have been told I have uh, RBF, uh, resting badass face, we'll call it. I look very angry and I'm totally not. Uh, I'm as approachable as everyone else in the department and we're all really good people doing our best and, and we will accommodate you to the extent that we can. Yeah, and, and um, everybody was super gracious, even with just my little, you know, um, the little mishap with me turning down my sound and stuff. Stuff like that is just going to happen, you know, or things not being posted or, or whatever. Um, so sometimes your professors may even need your help and kind of figuring out Canvas or something, too. So don't be shy. Um, thank you. Um, well, I, I was going to move on to Trinity. Is she here? Are you here, Trinity? Hi, Erica. Yeah, I'm here. I'm taking lunch in my car right now. Oh my gosh. Well, they, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is Trinity. Um, she is um, now an alumna of our program um, and was also a peer advisor with us last year. And we invited her to talk a little bit about um, what she's doing now. Um, so are you taking a lunch break from your job that you got yes, with your degree? I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and how you got there. Um, so I'm Trinity. I use she, her pronouns. Um, like Erica said, I just graduated this last spring and I'm currently doing with a private consulting firm with my WFPD degree. Connection is the best thing you can do. Um, I highly recommend keeping close contact with those who you meet, especially upperclassmen. Oh, is it cutting out? It is a little bit, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, you got to do what you can do. That's but okay. I, I got my job with a small consulting firm through a friend that I met during a field methods course in WFCB. They referred me over and I even started working last spring quarter when everything was online. Um, I really enjoy it. I get to spend a lot of my time outside, usually about 40 to sometimes more hours a week. I primarily am on sites, so different types of construction sites, making sure that they're following like CDS guidelines, um, anything for endangered species and making sure construction workers and everything is abiding by what they should be by their permits. Honestly, it's been a lot of fun and I've got to learn a lot of different things. I wasn't a big bird person before I started, but I've had a lot of fun learning a bunch of different birds and especially during nesting season, it's really interesting. Wow, cool. Um, so, uh, and hopefully our connection will continue. And um, if students have questions, you can go ahead and drop them in the chat because I'm not sure how long um, Trinity will be able to stay. But um, what kind of advice would you have for students who are, you know, like thinking about what they're going to do once they start looking for jobs? Um, what kind of um, maybe extracurricular experiences do you think prepared you for? Mm -hmm for this? Can you think of like what you like looking back, maybe um, some advice for students who are just starting out in our program? I think volunteering and interning is the best thing you can do as an undergrad, no matter what kind of internship it is. Maybe you're not super interested in birds, let's say, but it's a great way to start learning maybe what field work is like, um, how to learn how to do research. 
Uh, I think it's the best opportunities you can do. I've done a bunch of different internships when I was an undergraduate, starting off with the Nest Blocks project, which is pretty infamous in the WCB department, working with ducks. And I've also found some outside of the department. I spent the summer before my senior year working in Yosemite National Park as an intern, working with Western Pond Turtles and Red-Legged Frogs. And those are really great experiences to see what you want to do if you're interested in research, maybe management, and to start learning about what it's like once you graduate to, to be working full time um, and to talk to those who have already graduated and using their various degrees in an ecological field. I highly recommend it no matter what it is. Reaching out to staff and graduate students is one of the best things you can do for staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this actually uh, fits in really well with um, our next speaker is going to talk about internship experiences. <laughs> so um, uh, I think I'll, I'll let you off the hook for the moment. If you can stick around to maybe chat some answers to questions, that would be great. If it's not possible with your connection, they totally understand. Um, and maybe we'll send you some questions if, if they come in. Um, but um, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm so excited to hear from you, um, especially. Well, thanks, the Erica. <laughs> Super cool. Um, so, Maria, Maria Mendel. Hi. Hi. So, Sorry Maria to is our... Maria, uh, is Trinity still here? Oh, yeah, I think. Yeah. Trinity, I'm still here. good to see you again. I'm at the field station where our WFC 101 was taught, remember? Yes, when you brought up the tortoises, I remember the little plastic drawers that they were in the first time. Yep, that, they're, they've got 80 little babies in a plastic drawer behind me. <laughs> oh, that was a lot of fun okay sorry maria right. <laughs> okay and uh, yeah and you slipped in a plug for wfc 101 which is great um, so maria manuel is our new peer advisor um but she's not new to the program um she's mm -hmm. been with us for several years um uh, and so um you can go ahead and introduce yourself um and maria was going to talk to us a little bit about internships which um goes really well with what trinity was just talking about so yeah yeah, okay. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm Maria Manuel. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm a fourth year in the WFCB Department of Interest in Birds and Wildlife Health and Rehabilitation, which, which mostly means like taking care of like injured animals or something like that, working with them closely to make sure they can be released back into the wild. So, as Trinity said, gaining experience of volunteering and in Turning is the best way to get some work experience and also make connections. Like I know when I started out, um, I mostly had to do work, volunteer work, volunteer and intern to kind of get the experience I need to kind of like work my way up to like more harder to get internships. So I guess we could start with um, what an internship is. And an internship is a work experience that's either directly related to your major field or career interest. Uh, they usually vary between 3 to 12 hours per week and a quarter, and the, how long they can last really depends on um, what type of internship it is. And are there any internship opportunities that revolve around spot, freshwater fish aquariums? Yes, yes, there's definitely, uh, there's definitely going to be a lot of internships evolving, evolving that kind of stuff, because uh, you can mostly look at the fish department in terms of like the fish professor, NETAs that work under him. Maybe John might know more about the fish stuff because I'm a bird person, so I know more about bird stuff. So if you guys have any bird internship questions, hit me up. <laughs> okay, so on how to find an internship, like if you don't really know where to start, um, Erica will send out emails about internship opportunities from time to time. And should always check them out. Lot. Yeah, check those emails because inside them, you might get tired of getting emails from WFCB um, advising, but inside them are little nuggets of gold, like scholarships and internship opportunities and stuff. So yeah, be sure. To, oh, thank you, Hannah. I saw that. Yay. <laughs> so yes, um, check your email and. Yeah, like I actually got my first internship as a freshman from one of those emails the head advisor sent to me and it involved working with like black widows and brown widows in a lab 
And it was actually, at first I was like, it might be kind of weird, but it's actually like a really good experience and it helps you kind of like learn how labs work and how data works and all that. So I always recommend taking on internships, even if you're not initially interested in it, in it it's still a valuable experience and it could change your mind about certain things. So yeah, so continuing how to find, um, there's also Handshake, um, which is where it offers some volunteers an inter internship experience. Um, some may be off campus, but considering that most of it's online, I'm not really sure what the status of internships may be, but I could always, but I would always like check it out and like make sure there's some like something that could be used. Um, and also as professors and TAs, like I want to emphasize on the TAs because most of them are doing research as a, as part of their job and they usually they are usually like more available than professors because yeah and most will mostly be lab work and I would say field work but I'm not unsure due to the pandemic uh and internships uh no um you can usually start off an internship like your first quarter here like there's not really a timeline I think for when you could apply to your internship or not and mostly depends on like your experience, what you want it, and stuff like that. Thank you, Talia, for the question. And yeah, those are like the best ways to find some internships, definitely. I know I've used it a lot. Um, there's also the Sacramento Zoo for off-campus internships if you want to go into more zookeeping instead of field research. Uh, they offer a zookeeper aid internship after a few weeks of volunteering and I would check out their website to like double check on the status of it and I think it's a really good way to like get animal experience. I actually volunteered there a few times um, before the pandemic happened so I was, I was cut off a bit short but there you could work with like a various amount of animals like very closely in terms of animal handling like I got to work with some hedgehogs, some parrots, there was an armadillo there which is pretty cool. Never seen an armadillo before. Okay. So, um, and how to Basketball get internships. With legs. You usually need a cover letter, resume, and sometimes an interview depending on the internship. And if you ever need help with your resume and such, you can always take an appointment with ICC, which I'll link right now. Yeah, so they do do, they do, do online app appointments for helping with resumes and such. So I, before you submit your application, I recommend checking in with them to double check everything is focused and concise. Yeah, and um, one last tidbit for internships is that it doesn't have to be in a WFCD department. I think as Trin Trinity said earlier, like any type of internship or volunteer experience is always good because it will always be applicable to other um, work experiences and such. So you can always try looking at animal science internships. If you want to build experience with animals, you could try looking at other department internships, maybe for like organizational work. You know, that will always be good for your resume and stuff like that. So yeah, um, Thank you. that's all. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, point out something that Professor Todd just said. Um, your TAs are probably one of your best resources for getting into a lab um, or finding something to do that is uh, particularly related to what you're interested in. Um, TAs have a lot on their plate and um, they are grad students. Um, and if you're offering to help them, then they're going to grab you and hold on to you very tightly. Um, my first internship um, was uh, gone through a TA of my WFC 10 class. Um, I went to her office hours and she found out that I liked fish. So um, didn't let go of me. And I ended up sticking there for like a year and a half. Um, and as far as, uh, who was it? Bryson, I think. Bryson, you were asking about um, things related to um, aquariums or like freshwater fish and like habitat restoration. There's a lot of that going on at UC Davis. Um, we have a couple of, a few places actually. Um, there's the Center of Aquatic Biology and Aquaculture. Um, that's where a majority of the things with freshwater fish um, are going on on campus. Uh, and that's a really great place to check out. 
Um, there's also the Center of Watershed Sciences, um, which is right next to our academic search building um, that does a lot of cool work with the um, marshes and estuaries out at the bay. Um, and finally, if you're interested in anything like marine related, um, we have the Bodega Marine Laboratory, which is out at Bodega Bay. Um, and there's actually classes you can take to uh, progress in your major um, that are taught there every summer. I believe it's the EVE 115 class, which is the Experimental um, Aquatic Invertebrates class. Um, so lots of opportunities um, and lots of opportunities for you to go different places as well, because um, obviously, well, everyone's all over the place right now, but there's still internships that are happening um, that can be done so safely. So definitely, um, you know, reach out to your TAs and your professors because uh, they're great places to start. Thanks, John. Um, and and um, I, I may have been chatting in the chat or <laughs> reading it, but did you explain what you were doing in Bodega yet? I no, yes. Yeah. So well, you um, talked about sharks, but everybody might be kind of interested in that. Yeah, so just like a personal antidote, I guess. Um, one of the things, so one of the internships that I just got involved in, and I actually just got back from um, a couple days ago, was I spent the summer at the Bodega Marine Laboratory, um, and I was helping in the Morgan Lab. Um, and basically, my responsibility um, was, one, we went on a boat every day for two weeks um, in the open ocean to survey groundfish populations. Uh, so that was a really awesome opportunity that I also got paid for. So not all internships um, are just like free labor. Um, there's also ones that you can get paid for. So if you're, um, you know, you can't just like volunteer your time, there's ways around that. Um, and yeah, so I got to go on a boat every day for two weeks and I got to spend an, uh, almost an entire summer out at the marine lab um, surrounded by really awesome scientists that I was able to help out with their research um, and got to learn a lot of really cool techniques. Um, so that's just one thing, um, and you can find jobs like that through the Handshake app. Um, but again, I was notified about that through a grad student that I had worked with previously. Um, but yeah, I mean, Maria would know more about bird things, and Brian, I'm sure there's a lot of awesome um, reptile things that you can get involved with. But yeah. Well, I think... Um... We'll go ahead and open up the floor to questions um, for, I mean, you don't have to limit it to the chat if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question to Brian, John, Trinity, um, or Maria, or me for that matter. Um, do we have any questions? Brian, do you want to um, speak about the, like, Abroad opportunities and also the reserves. Um, yeah, I just had to unmute myself. Um, students find more study abroad opportunities than I'm actually aware of. Um, they are constantly coming to me with ones that are totally off my radar. Um, there's there's several that do show up from time to time that I see people requesting substitutions for courses that would otherwise count toward their degree that we generally approve as long as they're a good fit. Um, OTS, the Organization for Tropical Studies, uh, used to be a really big one when I was in college. It's still around. They run a lot, but primarily in Central and South America. Um, Operation Wallacea is another one that advertises pretty heavily on our campus and used to have people that would come to our classes and give an overview, trying to recruit students. Um, Various UC campuses have different ones. UC Berkeley has a study abroad program in Moria, which is a small island nation in the South Pacific, I think, um, that I've had a couple of students have taken classes there and had research credits as well. And, um, and then the UC system has all 10 campuses. Uh, each campus has a bunch of reserves that they run as part of the UC reserve system. We use them for teaching and research. I think there's somewhere between 35 and 45 reserves, although a couple of them just burned down recently, including Quail Ridge, where I take my HERP class. Um, and there is a program run by the UC Reserve System where you basically learn uh, several weeks of intensive ecology environment, uh, California natural history and field methods. And then you tour a set of those different reserves, uh, applying and le your learning and, and the techniques. And um, 
we've had just a couple of students take advantage of that. I'm not sure that it works out timing wise real well for quarter classes like it does for semester campuses, uh, but we do have students that take advantage of that. Um, I would always recommend before you um, do a study abroad, if you find one that's interesting to you, talk with your advisor, especially the staff and maybe master advisor, make sure that it's not going to be a waste of time. And, well, it'll always probably be uh, enriching, but to make sure if you want class credit, you're not gonna lose uh, time in your degree by doing that. Uh, so always check beforehand instead of after. Absolutely, yeah, there's no harm in just coming to see me first and we can check it out together and, and, um, and then ask Brian if we have specific questions. Yeah, and I, I love study abroad. I'm super excited when students are able to find something that works with the major. It's a wonderful and unique experience. It's the kind of thing you can sometimes only do while you're in college. So if you can, that's, it's great. Yeah, and I see Trinity, uh, the Institute for Wildland Studies is another one that I know students do a lot of. So um, any, any other, I have a couple of questions if nobody, if nobody else does. Um, so I was kind of curious about um, for Maria, John, and, and maybe Trinity too, when did you choose your area of specialization as far as choosing between wildlife and conservation, fish or wildlife health, um, which I guess none of you chose wildlife health, but at what point in your, um, in your time with us, did, did you know? Did you know right off the bat or did you uh, kind of take a class that turned the corner for you? So uh, I guess there's like two ways of answering this. One, you don't need to know until probably your third year. So um, all of the area specialization classes that you're required to take um, don't happen until you finish most of your prereqs. So that decision doesn't need to be made until later on. Um, but Fun fact, Professor Todd, you're gonna love this. Coming into college, I was fully like into reptiles and amphibians. Um, that was sort of my whole thing uh, all through like middle school and high school. Um, but after getting here, Team Fish dragged me in and I sort of um, decided on that pretty early on, like in, within my first year that See, I was. See, I told, you, I told you guys I was intimidating. Yeah, exactly. Honestly, didn't even know who you were yet. So don't worry about that. Still don't, I think. Funny jokes in class though, Brian. I heard you tell funny jokes. That's but I'm just saying. Don't I mean. tell my kid, he doesn't believe it. <laughs> so yeah, you don't need to know until your third year. And that's something that you'll discuss with um, probably Erica um, when that time comes and you're sort of completing your four year plan. Um, but you know, don't be afraid to like sort of probe around and see what you're interested in because you might change your mind. And changing your mind is totally okay too because that happens all the time. <laughs> okay, yeah. Maria, was it, was it about the same for you? Did, did you take a class that kind of changed your mind or was it an internship experience? Uh, it was actually multiple. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, so when I started out, I was, I was fully a mammals person. Like I really wanted to work with like mammals, mainly like lions and stuff because they're like pretty cool. But then like, um, so I started like working out, working out, I started working um, at the, I started volunteering at the California Raptor Center. That was like one of my first things as when I started out in college. And I felt like the bird life kind of chose me, if that makes sense. So like after working with like, owl talks and all that like you just kind of like get dragged into it and like I think it's mostly the experiences that you get and whether you like it or not that kind of like help you determine what you want to work with in terms of like in terms of like um, oh you want to do lab work you want to do field work or you want to do something more like re like rehab work um chapter center yes actually I, I think they are I'm not sure about new ones but i would contact um brett stedman um i'm not sure about visitors i think small only volunteers right now but i'll i'll link you guys like the contact information if you want to know more yeah that's mm -hmm. what i gotta say right now and somebody was asking like can i do birds and fish or whatever you'll take among all of the many many classes that you'll take um you'll notice in the uh curriculum that you choose um, just in that core curriculum, um, the, you know, 
three lectures and two labs among those. So if there are two animal groups that you're most interested in, those can be the ones that you choose labs for. And you're welcome to take as, you know, um, when you choose your extra wildlife classes to take even more. Um, it's just that fish has its own specialization. So if you're and, super into fish. I would also add that over the course of your career, you don't have to specialize in one thing. And often if you're looking at going to graduate school, you don't want to be thinking about specializing so, you know, um, discreetly with one group because, you know, graduate opportunities are, are uh, plentiful, but you've got to be flexible and open to the kind of opportunities that are out there. Um, what you're hearing from, from me and John and people like that is this, this sense that there's a little bit of a competitiveness and it's all really good natured fun. I remember running into a student once and, and overhearing him or her tell a bunch of the other students, oh, John Eady and Professor Todd don't get along very well. Because uh, we're always making jokes at each other's expense and at the expense of our study organs and that couldn't be further from the truth. We love it all. Um, and it's all a lot of fun for us. And it, honestly, I think uh, in full modesty, I would say that if you're an adult and you're really fixated on reptiles and amphibians, uh, you probably never outgrew a childhood fascination. I think people that work with fish and birds and mammals probably outgrew their first love, which might have been herbs. Uh, that just seems to be the case. So, I'll Brian, add, oh, yeah. I was going to say that, yeah, I definitely agree with Brian. Like, it's really great to be really interested in like a certain taxonomic group. But when it comes to working and like keeping opportunities open, it's great to be open to working with all kinds of organisms. I've worked with reptiles and amphibians, birds, I've done things with mice too. So it's good to be open to everything. And like I'm working out in the field doing stuff. And so I need to know things about fish. I need to know about birds, snakes. Um, so make sure you keep your options open and learn as much as you can. And these organisms don't live in their own bubbles, right? I mean, they're interacting in a community of broader um, interactions with both other species as well as the inanimate world around them. So you might have a career where you've got to understand a little bit of water chemistry to understand the impacts to the fish. Or you might be tackling a problem with an invasive species like I have that, that includes understanding invasive snakes, but you need to know invasion ecology, conservation ecology. You need to know a little bit about fish biology to understand the impacts that the snakes are gonna have. Um, so it's never as channelized as it, as it sounds. And, and ultimately we want you to have a well-rounded education that's broad in environmental and ecological and conservation um, systems um, more than anything else. The wildlife is the bonus on top. So Brian, we do have um, one more question in here that's good for you. Jacob asks, if you wanted to build a good base for going into native California herb research, would the general wildlife and conservation specialization be better or would the custom specialization be preferred? Uh, just the general one is fine. Um, honestly, the um, you'll get exposed to enough, uh, you'll get exposed to mostly the same classes regardless of how individualized you do or not. Um, the individualized area of specialization is primarily used by students who are looking at really focusing on marine wildlife. Um, trying to think of other instances, John might have some examples, uh, but the kinds of things where you really will be taking more classes outside of the department, but want to integrate them into your studies and training in our department. And, you know, wanting to become a future ornithologist or herpetologist, um, the, the broad uh, wildlife conservation biology track is more than sufficient for uh, all of that diversity. Exactly, yeah. Like Professor Todd mentioned, um, the air specialization, those titles um, really are just a um, way for us to label things, but it's really about the types of classes that you'll be taking within them. Um, so for instance- And the opportunities you pursue. Exactly. So I would really focus more on um, the contents of like what you'll be learning and like Brian mentioned, um, other outside of like focusing on um, marine things or also we mentioned animal behavior, um, you can also really kind of stretch it out a little bit. We've had students do things like wildlife journalism if you're more interested in like writing. Um, and you know, so yeah, again, being able to bring in classes from other departments um, to integrate with wildlife conservation because it's very multidisciplinary um, and you know it's a lot more complicated than just the animals. So, speaking of other departments, yeah, I mean, I, I'll address it. I see this question: Does our major tap into entomology at least a little, or other arthropods? 
And the answer is that for the most part, question no. from Francisco. Is Erica frozen or am I frozen? I think she's frozen. Okay, oh. well, I'll, I'll just go ahead and continue. And so I will say that um, there's practically no um, big interaction with entomology. Uh, there's not a lot of insect training or entomological training. Uh, we occasionally will allow substitutions for a course. I don't even know if, if just in, in general standing our major checklist, I don't think we even have any entomology classes that directly count toward our degree. Do you know, John? Um, yeah, so um, you can, uh, oftentimes we do substitute um, depending on like what your goals are. Um, but one of the primary ways to get involved in that is through the fish biology track. Um, like I mentioned, there's the um, experimental uh, experimental entomology course that's taught at Bodega Marine Lab, but there's also like the um, aquatic macroinvertebrates class um, that is on our checklist for fish biology, um, but is sometimes substituted for um, things that are more like aquatic based. But as far as terrestrial entomology, we do a little bit less of that simply because there is a major that's like geared towards that. Um, and I would add that um, we've had faculty meetings where various professors have, have uh, put forward their, their opinion that yes, absolutely, uh, insects and other invertebrate wildlife should be considered part of wildlife. But because we have this entire major and department in entomology, we simply ha don't really look to hire professors doing that kind of work. We focus more on the vertebrate and especially the wild vertebrate side of things. And like, as far as like classes that you'll be able to have a little bit more freedom on choosing. Um, like there's that checklist that you guys can scroll through, but you'll be able to like sort of customize your own experience. Um, most of you will be able to um, choose like these more um, off topic classes, like five to six of them, um, as far as like your major progression outside of your general education courses. Um, so you'll be able to fill in um, like entomology courses in there um, to also work towards your uh, degree. Yeah, and also like internships and stuff like that are, are a great way to um, learn more about things. You can learn, there's so many, so much learning opportunities outside of the classrooms, um, but that's a whole nother topic. And I had somebody talk about the Wildlife Society. Um, so we're wrapping this up now, but at two o'clock, uh, you'll notice, I, I, I guess they have some kind of a schedule that the college put out to you, which is how you all got here. But at two o'clock, there's a link to another uh, orientation session. And I have invited uh, representatives from the Wildlife Society, um, the Environmental Club and 27 Heartbeats to come and talk about their clubs and um, what they do and how you can join. So if you're interested in that, um, please come back. Uh, again, there, there should be another link um, in all the orientation information that you got at two o'clock. Um, and then otherwise, if you have any other questions for any of us, um, feel free to email us at, um, at WFCB peer advising or WFCB advising. I just sent out an email to everyone that has um, those emails in it and also a link to our appointment system if you want to make an appointment. Um, so um, I, in closing, I just want to thank uh, Brian for joining us, John, uh, Trinity and Maria. Um, and wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just showing you a little bit of the desert yeah. and there's a bunch of tortoises of various ages and sizes out there in these enclosures that uh, are uh, protected from predators. So this is some of the work that I do. Wow. So and fantastic. some of you and will so probably be able to see this if you ever take WFC 101. Uh, it would be the next time we teach it where we would likely be down here it would be 2022 and hopefully we'll be living in a post-COVID world. Yes, hopefully. And for those of you that don't know, WFC 101 is the research methods class where you generally get to spend two weeks out at some remote location with a couple of our professors and um, develop your own research project and sort of work through the entire scientific process, which is really um, awesome. Four years ago, it was the Channel Islands. Well, thank you all. Um, I know that you had a really busy day and that you have other um, other sessions uh, that you need to get to for the college or some of you might even need to eat lunch. Um, so um, thank you all for coming. Thanks so much to all of our presenters.
and I hope to see um, all of you students back at two o'clock if you're interested in those um, organizations. Yeah. Brian, did you want to? If, yeah, if I could just make a final plug. Uh, yeah. Be kind to yourselves through all of this. This is a very challenging time. And if you're kind to yourself, you'll find that it's easy to be kind to others and kind to your uh, faculty, professors, and staff, and TAs. And we're all doing our best, and we're all going to be here for you to the extent that we can. And if we can't answer your question, we'll hope to point you toward the people who can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, that, and uh, yeah, and don't be shy. I mean, I, my my job is actually to answer your questions. <laughs> That's the whole reason why I exist. <laughs> and don't forget that um, your professors are there for you too. I really liked what John had to say about those office hours. Um, they're, they're there for a reason and they're here for you. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome. And uh, we look forward to working with you. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much everybody. See you, Erica. All good? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I think it's good. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.